Okay, just a reminder that my name is Ann Sajak. I'm a parasitologist at Virginia Tech. And I'm talking about weeding out the wormy ones. This is the second part of uh, my lectures. And I'm gonna talk about managing worms. So in the first part of the program, I talked about what the worms are that we're most concerned about, what their basic life cycle is. But now what I wanna do is talk about our, our strategies that are available for managing parasites uh, and where we've had problems with those strategies uh, and what you have to select from uh, in managing your parasites. So I talked about the barber pole worm in the first uh, mini lecture. And as I said, this time, I wanna talk about strategies and problems. But before I do that, I want to reiterate the fact that if your animals graze, you cannot get rid of gastrointestinal nematode, nematodes. They will be with you always at some level. The goal is to reduce the number to a level that's below the number of worms that will cause you problems. If you want to eliminate gastrointestinal nematodes, then your small ruminants need to live something like this. They need to be completely off pasture. So since the 1960s, we've really relied on highly effective safety wormers for parasite control. Uh, the drugs that we have available have been wonderful. And Producers everywhere found that by treating all the animals at intervals throughout the grazing season, throughout worm season, we could stop worms being a major health problem. They just ceased to be a problem because we could eliminate them. But what happened was that in order to achieve this extremely low level of parasites consistently in all animals, the sheep and goats had to be treated so frequently that we selected at a pretty rapid rate for gastrointestinal nematodes, especially barbapol worm, that would be resistant to the effects of the drugs. I'm sure many of you already are familiar with this information, but I just want to review in case those there are those of you out there who aren't familiar with it, that we have basically three drug groups available for treating these GI nematodes. We have the benzimidazoles, which are commonly called white drenches. We have another group called the macrocyclic lactones or macrolides. And then a third group that includes drugs um, that work by the same mechanism of action and we call them nicotinics. And basically the important point to take away is that if you have drugs in the same drug group, they work the same way, and it means that once worms become resistant to one member of that drug group, they're resistant to every member of that drug group. So worms that are resistant to fembendazole are also resistant to albendazole, or worms that are resistant to Safeguard are also resistant to Belbazin. So we see that in fact, we only have three basic dewormers that we can use to treat sheep and goats for these gastrointestinal nematodes, and especially, again, barber pole worm. And because of that, resistance has become quite common. We have uh, barber pole worm that's resistant to one drug group. We have barber pole worm resistant to two of those drug groups. And I've seen a number of strains of barber pole worm that are resistant to all three drug groups. That has become a pretty common situation right now. Now, there are some ways to deal with that. Um, and I, I'll mention that again briefly a bit later, but it's extremely important to recognize that those multi-drug resistant parasites are out there. And if I can just give you a little bit of actual data uh, to indicate how serious this problem is, uh, Dr. Kaplan's lab at the University of Georgia has recently published some information. They've been monitoring the percentage of farms with resistant uh, barber pole worm. And you can see here that looking at uh, a number of farms from across the Eastern US, especially, uh, 
in the years uh, between 2011 and, and 2016, 100% uh, of the farms they looked at had barber pole worm resistant to um, the benzimidazole drugs, 41% resistant to levamisole, 95% of the farms had uh, barber pole worm resistant to ivermectin. And in sheep, it's uh, pretty similar, uh, a little bit lower uh, with the levamisole and the ivermectin, which probably reflects the fact that goats get treated even more frequently than sheep, because as you remember, I said that um, goats don't mount as strong an immune response to the parasites. So a very widespread problem. And it doesn't matter how conscientious you are about drug use, you probably can't avoid drug resistance because you'll buy it or trade for it, you'll bring it in, in the in animals that you introduce into your flocks and herds. And I just want to, uh, as a final point about drug resistance to say that you may think your drug is still working. You may be using um, uh, moxidectin or uh, valbazin and you think your drug is still working because none of your animals have died. But in fact, when you start using a drug, initially, it's effective, highly effective. As you keep using it over time, that efficacy begins to fall as you accumulate more and more drug resistant parasites. And eventually you'll end up at the point where the drug fails entirely. Whoops. And when that happens, uh, the next thing you see is this, and this is the skull of a ram uh, that died of barber pole worm infection, the owner thought that he was using a fully effective drug. But in fact, he had gone through all these stages and ended up here. But he didn't recognize, he didn't have a means of recognizing the stages where uh, the drug was only partially effective. And the problem with that is that, that it means that by the time you can recognize that you have drug resistance, there's so many of the worms that are, uh, that are resistant to the drug that you can no longer assess, uh, you can no longer regain susceptibility to the drug by not using it. So once you have a large proportion of the worms on your farm resistant to a drug, you stop using the drug and the worm population doesn't become susceptible again. So once you lose it, then by and large, generally it's lost. We only have three drugs, you can't afford to lose them. So what are your options for worm control? Well, I've talked about drugs and we still do need them. And there are ways to use them uh, smartly but we can't rely on them exclusively anymore for control. So they're a means of drug control, but only partially. The other thing you can do for worm control is to not use grazing because as I said, um, the GI nematodes don't survive well in barns or on feedlots. They don't, they need grass uh, to survive well, but just eliminating grazing isn't really possible or desirable for many owners. So what do we have for uh, parasite control then? And what you need to do as a producer is use a program of integrated parasite management. And that means you're using multiple techniques for the best parasite control. There's lots of things that you can do most of those things would not be as effective as a fully effective drug, but we're, we're past that. We don't have fully effective drugs anymore. So now what we have to do is create up a program consisting of several different techniques that will provide equivalent parasite control. And I look at, at it as a situation where we have techniques that are based on, uh, on management of the pasture, which effectively will reduce exposure to worms. And then we have techniques that are based on attacking worms in the animal. Now those two obviously overlap, but the way they're delivered 
kind of divides up between management on, of worms on the pasture, management of worms in the animal. So let me just kind of quickly go through these. You, uh, you'll be familiar with some of them. I hope that um, many of you are using uh, several of these, uh, but these are the kinds of things we're talking about with producers. In terms of pasture management, uh, one of the most important elements is that babies get the best. So that in other words, you take your most vulnerable animals and put them on the pasture that has the fewest larvae. You can rotate pastures, and this is a popular idea. We'll put animals on a pasture and then take them off, let the worm larvae die out, and then we'll put the animals back. But there's critical factors there on how long you have to leave animals off the pasture to get death of, of enough larvae to make a difference. You can also think about sward height. Generally, worms don't usually migrate more than four to six inches up the grass blades. So if you don't let them graze right down to the ground, they'll get exposed to fewer parasites. You can, re you can increase your stocking rate to try and minimize exposure. You could reduce the time on pasture without actually eliminating it. Alternate or mixed grazing where you mix sheep or goats with cattle or sheep or, go sheep or goats with horses, um, cattle and sheep are the, uh, horses, sheep and goats are the same as far as our barber pole worm is concerned, but generally horses have different species of parasites. Cattle generally have different species. So if you mi mix them together or graze first with one type of animal, then move them out, graze with an another type of animal, that's generally regarded as uh, being uh, able to reduce numbers of parasites in sheep and goats. There are deworming plants out there, forages that have uh, some deworming activity like Cerecia lespedeza, which some producers are able to utilize. And a new product is a nematophagous fungus, meaning a fungus that feeds on these gastrointestinal nematodes. Uh, you can feed fungal spores to animals. They pass through into the manure, and then the fungus eats the uh, gastrointestinal nematode larvae, including uh, barber pole worm larvae. And so uh, that's a new product that has recently become available in the US. So those are some techniques that can be used to help control worms on the pasture to reduce the numbers of uh, larvae that animal animals are exposed to. And then we have things associated with the animals themselves where we're looking at uh, reducing the number of worms in the animal. One of the most important of these is nutrition and health. You need a healthy, well-nourished animal in order to have a normal immune response that will help, lim help limit the worms. So it's very important that animals are, uh, are healthy in every other regard. If you want them to uh, be able to, to use their own uh, parasite control. We have dewormers still, we still need dewormers. Animals that are ill with uh, GI nematodes will need to be dewormed. And there are ways to use dewormers to help preserve the activity of those drugs, those ones that are still active, we wanna preserve that activity. And that's a very important part of our recommendations on parasite control right now. Uh, copper boluses can be used to attack barber pole worm in particular, and uh, are used especially now by uh, some goat owners and we have a few new products in development, but nothing coming along soon. But another thing then that can be used by everybody, everybody who owns sheep and goats can use genetic selection to help improve the ability of their animals to control the parasites for themselves. This is a really, really powerful tool. And it's the uh, purpose of our workshop to talk about genetic selection and how it can improve a number of traits in sheep and goats. So to summarize this little part of the program, 
all grazing sheep and goats have gastrointestinal nematodes. In most places, all grazing sheep and goats have barber pole worm at some level. The introduction of modern dewormers in the 1960s made parasite control really easy. And we took, we took advantage of that and really overused those dewormers so that now we have drug resistant uh, GI nematodes, especially barber pole worm, which develops drug resistance even more rapidly than the other species. These drug resistant parasites are widespread and their numbers are increasing. We can't rely on dewormers anymore for control. We have to use other means as well. And best parasite management programs combine different approaches to limit parasite numbers in the animal and on the pasture. And in our, our next little lecture, we're going to get to actually talking about genes and worms. And again, for any further in information on any of the control practices that I mentioned, you'll find information on the website of the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite, Parasite Control. So be sure to use that valuable resource. And so I will stop this portion of the program here. <laughs>